Uh, welcome everyone, this is Dr. Mercola, and today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Merzenek, who is a professor emeritus at the University of California, and he has pioneered research in brain plasticity for more than 30 years. He founded the Scientific Learning Corporation in Oakland, California, and uh, Posit Science in San Francisco, both specializing in the science research and brain training software, and in, has enormous implications on how we can you, uh, use this type of technology to help our own brain and uh, just like exercise. So it's really a phenomenal uh, com uh, piece of research he's been doing. And I've actually uh, first uh, learned of uh, Dr. Mersenek and um, when I saw his presentation that he gave at Google. So he's uh, gratefully uh, accepted our invitation to have a dialogue on this important topic today. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, it's very nice to be with you, Dr. McCullough. You use the term brain plasticity. I'm wondering if you could uh, expand on that and help our uh, viewers understand what you mean by that term. Yeah, it's sort of a confusing term, but basically it's simple in concept, uh, Dr. McCullough. The brain changes physically, functionally, chemically as you acquire an ability or as you improve at any ability. So you know this instinctively. You know something must be changing as, you, as your brain advances, as it progresses. And actually what it's doing is changing the local wiring. It's changing the details of how it's connected. It's also changing itself in other ways, physically and functionally. Uh, and, and those changes account for that improvement or account for the acquisition of ability. So you don't realize it, but as you acquire a, an ability, let's say the ability to read, you actually create a system in the brain that does not exist, is not in place in the non-reader. It actually evolves in the brain. I wonder if you could expand on the different factors that can contribute to either A, the deterioration of the brain, or B, the, the, uh, the exciting news that we can actually improve the brain function as we age. Well, we know as you age, there's actually an increase in chatter of the brain. The brain becomes less precise in how it's resolving information as you're, as you're operating in listening and language, or as you're operating in vision, or you're operating to control your your, your actions. And we actually see this increase in matter or noise processes of the brain as you age. And, uh, and in fact, we can correlate those changes quite directly with, with the slowing down of your processing. You know, every older person is slower in their actions, slower in their decisions, less fluent in their operations than when they're younger. And it's, they're slower because the brain basically is dealing with information in a, in a fuzzy or an integrated form. And you can actually drive a correction in the improvements of how the brain is resolving information in detail by appropriately and intensively training it. So you can go to the internet and use our brain training tools at a, at a site, for example, called Brain HQ. You don't have to pay anything to take a look at that. You can see, you have some very useful exercises there that are for free. And, and you can actually drive improvements, for example, in brain speed, in the, in the accuracy with which the brain represents information in detail. And basically what you're doing is recovering or reducing the chatter, the noisiness of the processes of the brain. And, and that impacts your capacity, for example, to record that information, that is to say to remember it. Because when the information is in a degraded form, when it's fuzzy, when it's imprecise, all of the uses of it that your brain makes basically is degraded, are degraded. And, and you can actually recover those abilities by these appropriate, relatively simple forms of training. Of course, you can also do things in your everyday life that contribute positively to sustaining your abilities in these ways and to keeping yourself, you could say, in a clear-headed operational state as well. Normally, you, um, you focus on the performance of impaired individuals, and, and, and that's basically what you're specializing in. And I'm wondering if you could um, describe the types of, of, of improvements you see in academic performance or proficiency and what could be expected from at least an, an optimal range of expectation from someone who's able to effectively implement your, your training strategies? Well, let, let's talk about it in two, two, uh, two, in two cohorts in the human spectrum. If, let's start with a child that is operating at, let's say, the 10th percentile in their, in their academic performance ability or in their ability to, to, to operate as a, uh, in language, in their language abilities or in reading. And we commonly see a child move somewhere into the center of the distribution with 20 to 30 hours of intensive computer-based training. Now that's a big difference for the child. It carries from the child, the child from a position in which they're at the bottom of the class 
on the average, to be somewhere in the middle of the class. And, and that basically gives the child a chance, you could say, a chance to succeed in life and in school. Now, it, it, consider an adult. Uh, we've done careful control studies in adults that have been trained uh, at an older age. And, uh, for example, a study was conducted by scientists at the Mayo Clinic and at an aging institute at the University of Southern California, uh, in which we documented very positive changes that were uh, that were driven by training. Training was about 40 hours in duration. Again, the training was computer delivered. And in that 40 hours, what we saw on the average in this control study was an improvement of cognitive performance across the board of about 11 years. So let's say that you're a 70-year-old. You know, after you're trained, you're operating as if you're roughly 59. We have actually extended the training to 40 to 50 year olds and we see almost the, the same magnitude effect. In fact, the effect is a little larger because their learning capacities are a little stronger when you're 40, 45, 50 years old. And we see changes of about the same extent. That is to say, we move you backward, you could say, and rejuvenate you to about the same extent. A little, the effects are actually a little larger. So. It, it, basically, everybody's brain is plastic. Everybody's brain is subject to some improvement. Now, I, I, as I said, I've been exercising for many years, and I, I know that just in physical exercise, there's somewhat of a controversy with respect to the I, optimal regimens and the type of exercise and such. So I'm wondering if you could maybe outline a range, at least from what your research shows, is what might be optimal to implement your program. You mentioned earlier that it works best on successive days. so. What, what, what is the ideal pattern, what is the optimal from your experience and research to actually implement the program, the length of time, the frequency, and, and how long is it done? And, and it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, and, uh, and uh, one of the great advantages that, that we have is that there's a very large body of scientific information that informs us about the optimum. And, and basically it comes from understanding scientific, uh, on a scientific level, the basis of what controls brain change. So we know how the machinery operates to, to control brain change. We know basically that you have to be engaged attentively. And in a sense, the more attentively uh, um, uh, focused you are, the more positive the enabling machinery of the brain is turned on. We know that rewards have to occur or information or feedback about how you're doing have to occur in a specific way to drive the optimum changes in the brain and so forth. We know that the schedule of, and the way stimuli change, the way difficulties change uh, in, in the task are crucial for driving changes with high, high sufficiency. One, one simple thing we do is to basically adjust the level of the difficulty in the task always so that the child is at a level in which they get most things correct, but they're capable of error. Because only when you're in this demanding situation, only when it matters to the brain, basically, does it, is the machine returned on to change the brain. But what, what is the ideal regimen? Would it be 20, 30 minutes a day, every day, uh, take a day a week off? And regular physical exercise is important to have recovery, so, right. uh, you know, let your brain rest. But this, is, this, this isn't as, as strenuous an activity, there's not, you know, so your the, the requirements. But, so can you do it every day, or is it... You know, what's, what's the, from a time perspective, what, what do you think the ideal is? At least 20 minutes a day. Uh, uh, no, no, long, no more than five or six or seven minutes spent on a specific uh, task mm -hmm. because the benefits weaken. Primary oh, benefits occur in the first five or six minutes of a specific task. Come back to the same task in subsequent days because coming back to the same task basically you have residual benefits that, that, are, that occur over the subsequent 23 hours or 24 hours and then coming back to the same task you're going to drive them very efficiently in a positive direction uh, and commonly the, you, you, you maximize the benefits in a specific task in 5, 10, 12 uh, brief sessions 7, 8 minutes a session then, 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 in, then it, you know, when it matters to you, it matters to your brain. When it matters to you, you are going to drive changes in your brain. Ah. And that's something always to okay. keep in track. If, if what you're doing seems senseless, meaningless, mm -hmm. it does not matter to you, it's not, you know, then, then um, you're, you're gaining less from it. Okay. And, and, and there, you, you, it's best if you move on to something else before too much time spent. So you've got six categories, and, and am I correct in assuming it takes several months to progress 
from the beginning to the end of that category. And then your suggestion is to rotate through those categories or to do multiple categories simultaneously. Right, and you can also assess uh, how you're doing because you can initiate exercise in any one of these categories and you can, again, calibrate yourself against everyone else mm -hmm. that's done those exercises from the, uh, in the world. Or you can actually also compare yourself with, say, every other 70-year-old or every other 50-year-old. Every other and you can see basically how you stack up. And uh, you can see where you need the most help. Or you can say you, could, you can prioritize what you think you need to focus on most directly. And you also know in your own life, to some extent, where you've never been as strong as you might mm -hmm. wish to be, or whether you feel the most negative change in your life, where you feel that you've had the biggest losses. And focus on those. Well, can you, can you recommend a program that the average adult could engage in to uh, minimize this decline and to maximize their brain performance? Because I really think anyone here, if, if we uh, seek to live out our life expectancy, which could be well over 100 years for many right. people watching this, the one, we, the one aspect that we fear the most is the ability to lose our brain function. So I think this is really a crucial uh, area that that's may, maybe we don't appreciate now, but if we take, be aggressive and, and take a proactive approach, we can have a huge impact down the road. So what would you recommend as the ideal program to, for a person to maintain and optimize their brain function for the average adult? Well, first of all, if you are behind, you might consider going to a brain gem site like Brain HQ and looking at that and maybe using that as a catch-up strategy. But let's talk about it in terms of your everyday life and how, how you might think about living your everyday life from the point of view of maintaining your brain fitness. The first thing I think that I would highly recommend, I think everyone should do, is everyone should spend a period of at least 15 minutes a day, ideally 20 or 30 minutes a day, in, in, in physical exercise, mm -hmm. that's brain guided. Now what, what I mean by that is, is that when you exercise physically, you should not be thinking just about strength and flexibility in the gym. You should be thinking about using your brain to control your actions. And one simple way to, to achieve that is by taking a daily walk. And when you take a daily walk, do two things that you maybe aren't, aren't up to as you're walking. The first thing to do is don't put on that, that iPod or that or the headset and listen to the radio. Drink in the environment. Record it, reconstruct it in your mind. Basically, we are constructed to, to uh, take in the details of our physical environments and to interpret and reconstruct them. And it's a critical form of exercise for us, basically, to, to, to refine our navigational skills and abilities in this sense to basically look at the landmarks, to look at the details, to record them in detail, and, and also to look for all of the surprises that are out there in the environment. Because if you walk across the landscape and are paying attention, you cannot take a walk for 15 or 20 or 30 minutes without being surprised. And the brain loves surprises, because surprises means that it must be engaged to interpret what they mean. And uh, the other thing you should be doing when you're walking is you should pay attention to, to your physical body. You should feel yourself again. When's the last time you actually thought about the feelings of your movements? The second thing I'd highly recommend is you try to find ways to engage yourself in new learning as a continuous aspect of your, of your life. And by new learning, I mean you're always taking on the new hobby, the new skill, the new, the new whatever to, to, to improve yourself, to enrich yourself. The third thing I'd strongly recommend is that you engage yourself as a matter of habit in some way that exercises yourself socially. Because your social brain is an aspect of your brain that is very susceptible to deterioration and degradation mm -hmm. as you age. This, this is expressed, for example, in what's called mindfulness training, mm -hmm. in which, in a sense, you're drinking in the world again as if you were a child. You're, you're looking at the wonder in the flower. You're looking, in the, you're looking with curiosity again at the movements of the, of the lizard. You know, you're engaged again in the, the tales of the world and in life. You're associating what you hear with what you feel on the, on the skin. Uh, it's, in, it's incredibly important that you engage the brain in all of its details of how it's drinking in information because, again, this re relates to the fidelity with which it will represent it for all of its operations. So these are a few. And then, of course, you want to continue to challenge yourself and you want to continue to engage in things that matter to you. 
The brain only changes, only permits change, when in a sense what you're doing matters to you. So it has to be seriousness of purpose in what you're doing. You know, too casually, too softly, too easily across life, nothing changes. Well, let's take a, talk a little about the training strategy options. And, uh, you know, you've developed this brain HQ that you refer to. Right. I wonder if you could describe that in a little more detail and, and uh, uh, you know, and also mention, you know, if it's available just on the web or if there's a, there's a smartphone or um, iPad applications, device applications for that, because it it's, seems to me a very powerful uh, tool that one can incorporate into, in addition to the strategies that you referenced early, earlier. It's on, it's on the web, and, and, uh, and in, uh, in September there will be an iPad form of it, and, okay. and actually there will be a link between the iPad form and, uh, and uh, this is September of uh, 2012. And there's also a link between the iPad form and the and desktop or laptop computer form so that if you work on one, all of the information, all of the data you have uh, is stored for your use in the second device. So I can use my iPad when I'm, uh, when I'm, uh, when I'm at home or on, at a, at, in the park or wherever. And I can use, the, I can use the, um, the desktop operations when I'm in my office or maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm in another place in my life. And, and all of the data is recorded so that so that's as if you're just moving from one to the other. Uh, uh, it's it's basically there are things at the site that are free that are useful, uh, and there's a, a rich series of things that are there now. But as you, but they're being continually added to, and also we are bringing onto the site a number of of special challenges or programs for people that have a history of special need. 